The year is 2006, and I find myself watching a trailer for Bioshock during a stage in my life where seeing a CGI man made of donuts is something I shouldn't have really been seeing. So of course, the logical course of action to that trauma is to play the game which was advertised. Capitulated to the horrors of this contorted world, my body was tensing, hairs standing, the cries of the fatherless sisters, the muffled thumps, followed by groans of the... See, man, the uncertainties of what acrobatic manifestations laid in a blanket of darkness, only for the reveal to be of familiar figures, people, but disfigured with hooks for hands, and oh god, and the dread of collecting all the achievements. 80,000 gamer score, by the way. And being under the age of 10, my brain finally clicks and pumps so much serotonin as I gun down everyone with my lol Tommy gun. And whilst that sentiment holds true in memory, the visuals still have an eerie value to it. However, after playing through the game recently, I found it more terrifying through its writing over visuals, which makes total sense with the game I focus on in this video. With my newfound ability, to read and comprehend, this makes originally once was a dark facility that was covered by cries for help that vandalized the walls in blood and audio diaries discussing symmetry, you know, like the shape of a triangle, became a palace inhabited by zealots corrupted by obsession. Unbeknownst to me, the whole symmetry thing wasn't about shapes after all. This one, too tall! This one, too symmetrical! And now, an intruder! He's ugly! You know what? I want my money back. The big daddies are a less a threat to me now than before. They just casually mope around, not being a problem unless you become one yourself. That behavior allows splices to be more of a creature than that walking submarine. Every individual one shrouded by the ugliness and obsession of beauty. A hostile behavior with no second thought of attacking you because gamers are the most unattractive thing to ever exist. All in all, Bioshock is a game. But this begs the question, what could have possibly inspired this? Well, what do you mean? The same people that made both of these, of course. Let's talk about this one. I remember hearing of this game for the first time back in the early 2010s, which makes me feel old. But also pathetic when the game is now two decades old and then its community has been around since release. And here I am, acting as if I found El Dorado, and I'm Elena Fisher. I must show this hidden gem to everyone. What? Oh, no, my camera! However, I also like to believe that people are introduced to System Shock through Bioshock. <laughs> but now I can't decide whether if its player base is now three decades older than I am or not. Yeah. And I know that generation is gonna hate this video solely because of my childish humor. It's okay, you can push your copy of Windows 98 down. I am very much in touch. Hit me again, I like it. I used to hear so much about how this game was scary, how messed up it was, so I had to check it out. I see this image, an ominous face staring back at me in a dark space. <laughs> Get it? Ooh, I thought. I ventured to the Steam page, awaiting what hid behind those digital doors, and my teenage brain went from fear to laughter. No, 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 look at this one! You look like Bobby from... I was at a time where the legend of Bigfoot in GTA was one to keep your wits about. Where learning that the Half-Life 2 zombies actually screamed for death in reverse. Where Slenderman made me afraid of silhouettes in the dark. Ha! Where the G major mess of Sonic CD's hidden screen was bedded in questions of why it existed. Well, the Japanese one does sound funky. Take that, the West. Thing but Japan wins again. <laughs> I was pre-equipped with a passion in the worst written creepypastas, so I was ready for some spooks. Instead, I was face to face with Mr. Potato Head, but I pushed on. So eventually, I added it to my wish list and totally forgot about it because I had no money. As I'm writing this, I have around 45 hours played, which pretty much amalgamates to two entire playthroughs. I feel it can overstay its welcome at times, feeling stretched, leading up to 16 to 20 hours to finish, depending on if you can find that missing key card to progress. This body, uh, no. Or this one, no. Uh, this one. Oh, bag of crisps. This game is pretty expensive, to say the least. Going from Bioshock to System Shock, it's easy to spot how streamlined for accessibility Bioshock appears in comparison. More so to tap into the new console platform. The shitbox speed 60. 
You can play- That isn't to say it's bad. Simplicity in games can offer so much with less. Bioshock has elements that System Shock lacks of, like how your surroundings itself isn't just a set piece of spooky aesthetics, but ones you can use to your advantage through EVE hypos. I think this drives a real connection to the world, giving it a sense of life, and it's nice how a seemingly simple thing can do that. That said, System Shock 2 can be overwhelming at first, but one easy laxative to swallow is that you don't have to do everything it offers. If you are, the completionist channel is that away. It's one of the few games that warranted a second playthrough shortly after. The game Play appears standard, but you know, the proof is in the pudding. After dinner, of course. The non linear storytelling was confusing and I was lost. But I was hooked! Drama, drama, action, action, love, love. live and laugh. Live and Safe to say, my second playthrough was nothing like the first. Oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. Different build, different weapons and abilities. Did I mention this was an RPG? I know the scarcity of resources, and I'm eager to try new weapons and elements. I begin to understand the backstory, as now the unknown becomes known. My search history becomes a System Shock 2 fan wiki, and I listen to an entire audiobook of all the logs playing in chronological order. Because, pff, you expect me to reach the final boss fight and to listen to all of these to understand what even is the point or why anything has happened beforehand at all? The dates aren't even in order. <sighs> But allow me to take you to a year where most of you hadn't seen the light of day yet. For System Shock 2 is a time capsule of evolution, innovation, and a game defining gaming? Who, who wrote this? System Shock 2 is the keynote before the A24, oh for fuck's sake. Obvious sequel to System Shock 1, a game that visually makes System Shock 2 look like diamonds, and Bioshock look like netherite, an infinite like... Let's talk about Shock 1 quickly. Developed in 1994 by Looking Glass, the studio behind Ultimate Underworld and Football Man, the game set the foundation for System Shock 1, and you can see in its- wait, I mean Ultimate, not John- and you can see in its visual style in overcomplicating the UI, which is a lot, but for sure, it fits the aesthetics of cybernetic augmentations and Microsoft Excel. Ultima was made two years prior to System Shock 1 in March of 92. It was also made two months before Wolfenstein 3D, so everyone's saying that Wolfenstein was the first FPS. You're all wrong, because actually it was Hover Tank 3D. <laughs> Who knew that cool math games had a resurgence? Shock 1 is a game that I played and appreciate solely for my pretentious soapbox of playing odd games unlike anyone else. Oh, have you guys heard of Doom? <laughs> of course oh, you goes. haven't. I like the main villain of Shock 1, Shodan, acronym for... Yeah, I'm not reading that. Shodan was solely constructed to serve mega corporation Trioptimum, and she was made to mine Bitcoin all day for the corrupt Carpo suits. And obviously, like anyone else who's a wage slave, they go rogue, creating unions, rioting, and making a cyborg army. Wait, what? During the game, she puts up a facade at first, but you gradually see it slips as she intercepts messages you receive from other people. We have some new evidence about what happened. It looks as if Diego has... I prefer a quiet station. Thank you. The personality of being condescending yet collected in confidence and tone, accompanied by a contorted voice between male and female, makes Shodan a greatly sinister character. Shodan sounds even more sinister when she babbles on in German. But I'm just unfavorable of the Germans. They scare me because they can outdrink me. And spoiler alert, she gets defeated in cyberspace, completely epically owned by zeros and ones. Unfortunately, I haven't brought myself to finish it. Not because it's boring or that it looks bad. Contrary to that, actually, I find the charm in its graphical restrictions. The problem is, it's entirely my fault. I have no idea what I'm even doing in that game. I see funny cyborg, I shoot. Simple as. System Shock by Origin successfully weaves adventure and action to create a novel science fiction challenge. Experience the most sophisticated physics system in a computer game. Because it has to be 
<laughs> but I also have a bug where my visuals have this ghosting effect and it's choppy, so personally it's unplayable. I can't find a fix, so if you know or know anyone who does know a fix, you can email helpmefinishshockone at gmail.com a solution to help the movement of Ramska finishing System Shock 1 for the very first time. The game's monetary reception was okay, to say the least, and it allowed Looking Glass to continue production. I guess you just gotta learn to live in the shadow of those you inspire. They continued and managed to produce titles like Thief, a game I got for free on Xbox Live Gold, and I believe it's safe to say that without the production of Thief, some games that we've come to know and love might have not have existed thanks to Looking Glass and the team of individual minds, creators who aspired for new feats. I just want to mention, I love this IGN interview with Warren Spector, a man who helped produce Shock One. There's a tendency among the press to attribute the creation of a game to a single person, says Warren Spector, creator of Thief and Do Sex. So let's focus on Ken Levine, Lamau. After working in design and story, Ken gathered enough experience and decided to leave Looking Glass after Thief and began a new studio, Irrational Games, known for Bioshock, Bioshock 2, this one. Don't tell anyone I like this one. But prior to these statements in gaming, Irrational found themselves in Ken's living room, storming their brains on what could be their very first project. Ooh, I wonder who that could be. Hello? Yes. Okay. Yes! Alright, sure. Call you later. Damn ass. Oh, who was that, Ken? Oh, no one, Jonathan Che from Irrational Games. That was just my old boss, Paul Neurath, the founder of Looking Glass, who also at the same time is looking to develop a new game, a space game. Look at him, so why not cooperate with people they're familiar with? So they began doing whatever developers do, some nerdy programming or something, crafting an experience delving into the vastness of space with a hint of inspiration from the novel Heart of Darkness. The aim? Go to a spaceship and kill the rogue commander aboard the vessel. Development was nearly gold. The gang looked around for publishers, pitching their idea, until one day, pre-Dark Age publisher EA picked them up. Proposing that they could actually, in fact, make System Shock 2, considering that Electronic Arthritis held the rights to System Shock. But suddenly, Ken turned around, he said. I'd rather see Valve disintegrate than sell out. What a brave, wholesome, and humble man. So LG and IG went under EA to change the writing to make System Shock 2. And resurfaced later at E3 in May of 99. Right, mate. Yeah, this is E3, this is the one time of year event where all the major players in the industry get together, see what the other guy has, and schmooze. People at E3 who are familiar with System Shock were looking forward to it. People at E3 who are not familiar with System Shock were not looking forward to it. I think? Also, not so fun fact, the team were approached to E3, their demonstration build of System Shock 2 had been requested to remove the guns due to the recent Columbine shooting a month prior. This was 1999. Critical eyes were on developers at E3, sniffing out the scent of violent video games. Developers had to keep their wits about and be careful with every move they make just to make sure that their low profit company would make profit. The E3 trailer still had guns. The game hits the shelves. Players crowded game stops. Critics loved it. They marveled. No, dare I say, pog champed at such a masterpiece like myself. An estimated 58,000 copies were sold by April of 2000 from its release back in August. Compare that to Half-Life, a game everyone has played but little have finished past Zen, released in November 19th, 1998, selling at least 200,000 copies by 1999. Revenue was low, probably because 4chan didn't exist at the time. But hey, if you want to be a popular game, just wait 20 years. You'll become a cult classic eventually. One day, Witcher 3, one day, you'll be loved by many. A spoonful for daddy. Irrational would continue their future, but Looking Glass would later close the doors for the final time in the year 2000 due to financial reasons. What they left behind were remnants to continuously appear in future titles. So here we are in 2013. A new studio forms, Night Dive Studios, porting old games to be compatible with modern hardware. Their first title to optimize? System Shock 2. And its release on GOG and Steam would only bring more notoriety to the franchise, hence why this video is even a thing. So now, can we talk about the game? All right, okay.
Right off the bat, the first notable thing is how System Shock 2 takes a little more of an ambientic approach than its counterpart. Starting a new game, we're given a very brief recap on the first game where the hacker, the player, defeats the System Shocker or something, I don't know, I haven't finished that one. The setting is now, 42 years later, and a triuptimate advertisement begins playing, foundationing the setting of the game. Von Braun's the new starship, owned and operated by the Trioptimum Corporation, and it's about to ongo its maiden voyage, equipped with FASTER THAN LIGHT technology, with the purpose of space exploration and scientific discovery. The FTL tech was developed by Marie Delacroix. Huh. I wonder what flavor. She will make an abundance of appearances throughout the game. The Von Braun is like Ryanair, but for space. The universal trading currency? Nanites. For facilities like consuming. Bitcoin is also canon in this universe, as these gremlins keep making me lose my money. Don't beat. Following them as their security detail is the UNM Rickenbacker, a ship run by a government organization by the name Unified National Nominates, in which occupy three military branches. The UNN came to be in 2074, two years after the events of the Citadel in the first game, and, as the wiki says, the UNN was created by the ineffectual governments of Earth's nations to stop the influence of mega-governmental corporations' abuse. And, considering that this game exists, I doubt that plan went very well. Checkmate. You play a soldier. Under the serial number... Uh... Goggles. The silent protagonist on the Von Braun. Clearly ripping off the character... Uh... Red. From Pokemon. Uh. Gordon Freeman spitting mad facts. Today is the first day of training for the UNN. Basic training? <laughs> We're gamers. We don't need to know how to press left click. What are you? Do you not have opposable thumbs? No. Advanced training offers a concise explanation of the main abilities in the game. Psy, which has an array of abilities, or disciplines, the game calls it, which as you progress, gets more expensive and very situational. Yet it's useful. Hmm. This uses up your Psy bar. This is basically a mana bar, but some creatures like to call it a stamina bar. Technical caters towards hacking and repairing, and weapons explains that as a gun, and it can break. If it breaks, that's bad. Continuing forward, we're greeted with three branches, OSA, Navy, and Marines. These will act as a starter foundation for your skill points. OSA gives you the choice in side disciplines. Navy is for technical. This is good if you like money and never pay for a round of drinks, you leech. And Marines is for weaponry. Additionally, giving you a head start in some weapons, maybe something a little more high end, like heavy weapons, or maybe a... Uh... <clears throat> Energy weapons, ooh. First time players may come across choosing and wonder what any of these words mean. It's hard to figure out without visual explanation. If you pick OSA, it's canon that in the first year, Goggles goes into a deep state of meditation inside a pod, like an Ava entry plug. Afterwards, a pre-rendered cutscene is played. Because this is a game from 1999, the quality is a lot more pixelated than Japanese porn. Ugh. You are five months into the voyage of the Von Braun, and it's clear something's not right. I'm not sure if you could tell with how lost footage this feels, S-shake, camera glitch. It feels very Andrew Kramer here. Quality limitations of this cutscene plays incredibly well to its initial mystery, making it difficult to distinctively examine the CCTV footage. Though the low quality isn't its intention, I've always and ever increasingly loved the way developers made use of technical limitations. It really shines a light on a developer's creative agility. Reinitializing memory strings. Restoring patient memory. Restoring memory. Restoring memory. Steady yourself, soldier. This is Dr. Janice Polito of the Computer Ops Staff of the Von Braun. You're safe for the time being. You're recovering from the effects of surgery and will be unable to remember any of the events of the last few weeks. You're on board the starship Von Braun and something's gone very, very wrong. Some kind of force has hijacked this ship. That's why you volunteered to be implanted with some experimental cybernetic implants. Rely on your cyber interface. It just might save your life. You must find an elevator and come up to Deck 4 to meet me. Deck 4. Can you remember that? But keep your eyes open. They're after us both now. 
you're prematurely awakened from your cryo sleep with an error in memory restoration, leaving you with crippling dementia. I have no idea why they store a person's memories to the cloud like a PS Plus account. It sounds counterproductive now considering that Goggles' memory is scrambled. Why not copy it and have backups? It's 20 plus years of a person's life, not 60 hours on Persona 5. After that, you're given a goal. Find the person contacted you on deck four. Here you are, you can now play the game. Here's a reg, go kill some people. Over a kill. Also, I noticed how when you were choosing your abilities at the start of the game, with OSA and Navy, no matter what you chose, you were always given one plus strength alongside other abilities. I like to imagine that during developing without this plus one strength, playtesters found themselves soft locked when trying to do melee damage with the wrench, applying no force at all. Of course, I don't have footage of this, so uh, just imagine that the table didn't break here. Yeah, there you go. Gameplay. System Shock 2 is a game of wits outsmarting the enemy, unlearning what you know, understanding the adversary on the playing field, and avoiding the chimps' incredibly high IQ insults he projects to belittle your self-esteem instead of feces. The game starts off placing the player in front of the two main ways of progression of areas, keycard locked doors where you have to find the correct keycard, and a key padded door where a code is needed. This is a simple yet efficient way of telling the player that these exist in the game. Of course I prefer the key coded doors compared to the key carded doors as they add more than a single route of progression, giving the player two solutions to a problem, either you find the code or simply hack through it. Otherwise, the corpse nearby holds the first audio log of the game, stating that the door code was changed, telling the player what it is outright? I'll set the new code to 45100. In whose right mind would record their password on an audio tape? Well, I hope you have a two-factor authentication. The code is 45100. And in the world of immersive sims, everything is widely known at this point about 451, and that it's the looking glass code. This code has reappeared through multiple combinations in other games, so that by definition makes a game good. Really? Really? The looking glass code? Really? System Shock 1 gave life to this trend, as the first locked doors code was 451. Which, ironically enough, was the code to get into the office of Looking Glass Studios, but uh, don't tell anyone I told you that. I don't want to cease and desist. Right behind you. Also in Prey, the so heavily focused on material that's used to project photoreal images is literally called the looking glass. It cannot be any more subtle. Past the star, we get our first glimpse of the enemy. Chasing a low poly female. Why does he have a shotgun? Because of the soldier's memory loss, the player can better insert themselves into the character as they have no idea what the hell is going on. Look, I know, it already doesn't look like the most appealing thing in the world. Everything looks jagged, low quality, and plain. But if you're such a certified visual cinephile, how come I never see you complain about movies like, uh, Citizen Kane? They forgot to add color to that film. But hear me out. One of the strongest muscles in the anatomy of System Shock 2 is how well it is at distincting the area that you're in. Hypothetically, if you're placed in an area out of nowhere, a few seconds of observation would give you an answer. Medsai is scattered with dead security personnel that emerge from their quarters, gurneys that'd be found so easily, and a stuffy cremation room, which is, wait, that's a fire hazard. A gamer's wet dream of LED strips and mommy issues in the hydroponics deck, bearing floral incubators, supporting the crew as a food supply which is now overrun by the enemies. Recreational deck is my favorite. With its bustling nightlife, air filled by howls of the casino. Head to the bar and lose yourself in a glass of smooth Suntari. Once you've had your fill, why not have your instinctual senses misted by the pheromones of the outer space brothel? Oh, this is way too expensive for my taste. I could be embellishing all of this, considering the way I describe some parts, especially when the graphics are extremely 90s. But setting the tone is really important, plus I'm no white light, I'm not as flavorful as he is. Lighting plays a huge role in its theatrics. Given the team's previous game, Thief's main mechanic was to live by the shadows in stealth. With a feature as important as that, you'd bet the lighting is good. Safe to say, they didn't rob us of our money. Cause, cause Thief? Fuck, I need an editor. The lighting delivers in System Shock. Fluorescent tubing, hanging lights, blinking in its last spark, lights from space, how? I love the advantage used of Medsai's atmosphere. Usually you think of science labs or medical wards to be brightly lit by white lights, every nook and cranny to be illuminated, clean and sterile. 
but such expectations are dismantled. Few appropriately lit areas are to be found. Its use of colour is colourful. Anything that isn't blue or white usually is a sign of danger or uneasiness. Like a turret showcased under the dangerous blankets of crimson. Or this contaminated radiation zone, drowned in this disgusting green, accompanied by the crackling of your augmented Geiger counter and... <laughs> One thing I like about this area is that the decontamination sequence isn't set dressing. It actually cures the radiation that you build up in there. It's a nice detail that's easy to miss because you don't expect that level of detail in old game, but that's me projecting. Lighting in games are usually used to direct players into the right direction, and System Shock subverted my expectations by not doing that, but actually they are used to highlight signs that them themselves offer directions. At least it's subtle compared to an arrow on the floor. Ooh, this way to save the world! This technique is a simple yet effective way of making atmosphere as well as guiding the player somewhat. A dark room with the most important thing of note, distinguishedly lit by what light? Shiver me Timberlands. Sometimes the light sources are questionable, either being lit seemingly out of nowhere or the laws of lighting are broken because fuck the man who invented physics. Sometimes looking like it's been painted on with the illusion of a source with static dark spots despite being in clear view of a light. But most of the time it's incredible and it really sells the tone at once. From a design point, lighting could be so useful for limited resources. You can hide so many imperfections with just static lighting. Just leave the lower detailed aspects in the shadows. Unless you're Rockstar and want every grass foliage to have every individual individual microscopic fiber rendered in 4K, then you, my friend, deserve an award. Dumbass. Hey, 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 get back to work or I'm ducking your sick leave. Those skin flakes aren't gonna flick themselves, you know. You're making a habit of costing me more than time and money. Despite my appraisal, I'm indecisive on the complexity of Shark's lighting. Goggles' body doesn't cast any shadows, enemies don't cast any shadows, though the shadows react and manipulate to the shape of your hands and your adversaries. But on the other hand, with new sources appearing in, that also affects lighting in surrounding areas, but that could just be pre-animated. Needless to say, the quality of lighting is inconsistent. Irrational's later titles got even more creative with lighting, taking advantage of harsher effects, which results in a dynamic that creates this amazing fake out. There's a really good video by Digital Foundry that goes in depth into the science of lighting in games, using Halo Infinite's shoddy presentation as an example. I think it's worth checking out because I think this person knows what they're talking about compared to, mmm, color green gives me cancers. <laughs> but finish this video first, please, I beg of you. Some of your surroundings are destructible and because of movie video game logic, one small bullet from a pistol makes thing explode. <laughs> And the environments themselves are actually really good. Many dead bodies are prominent, with sparing visuals and careful placement, positioned by bullet holes, sliding doors, and a bottle of Smyrna ice. I mean, you kind of deserve that. It's minor details like this that show the devs thought about so much during development, creating stories through static imagery. That's a thing called environmental storytelling, as the gamer lingo goes. It's really neat. My face is tired. Or the more technical term known as mise-en-scene, because, you know, the English like to steal words from the dirty French every so often. System Shock has plenty to offer. First one being a warning painted with blood. Ooh, scary. And it tells us to remember Citadel. You may be a martyr for art, but this isn't a Banksy. <laughs> $10. Sometimes you will do things and you will piss off the ship. Literally. This is Xerxes. Why do you persist in your loneliness? This is the ship's AI, Xerxes, and he controls the security on the Von Braun. And he really, really hates you. Wait, wait, wait. Who's this? Where's they? Intruder. He'll announce himself, demanding you to respect the many. Ooh, mysterious. He'll show up frequently, just don't listen to him. He's like the little brother who thinks his controller's plugged in, just, just let him enjoy himself. In what feels like every corner of the Von Braun are security cameras, but they feel more like de-security than security. Check your corners, clear left. They mindlessly pan left and right and make a smooth whirring noise. And when you hear that sound pause, you move from around the corner. Then you can make your move to take it out. 
make your move to take it out. There you go. If you're spotted, they'll beep and track you for a moment. Just hide long enough and it'll make a sound notifying that it's back to business as usual. But if you aren't fast enough to hide, they will start a two minute alarm. Casting calls for extras for the production of your death. There's a neat side discipline which shortens the time of the alarm. So if you have that, just, just spam it. But if you ever so make a peep out of cover during its reset, no second chances. Which sounds fair, but security cameras here are a little weird compared to the ones in, let's say, Bioshock. When you're spotted, but you hide, you'll notice that if you move and stop over and over while remaining in cover, you can hear it worse simultaneously with you, as if it has wall hacks. Meaning, if you get spotted from one end of a room, but reappear from another, you'll be spotted instantly, because I think the game overcompensates for object permanence. And it's clear the team Irrational learned from this, as cameras in Bioshock pause as soon as they lose sight of you. Additionally, it has an audible countdown ticking until it resets. Cameras are usually appropriately placed next to corners or in sight of corners, but sometimes they will be in open areas. I found it fairly simple to just run under them as it counts as a blind spot, then take them out from there. Anyways, on top of that... <laughs> Turrets. Sometimes you'll encounter turrets, but they're not on your side. Programmed to attack you on sight, they are ruthless and they will stop at nothing until you drop dead. You can either empty out what remains of your ammo, disable security and hack them, or hack them as they are active. But I would reconsider tinkering with them when one is near the other. Though, the placement of the turrets are questionable. At first they seem placed strategically, but over time it becomes sporadic, being in places that seem unturret like Sometimes it's made to make you feel trapped and no other way to progress than to shoot back. And System Shock really likes to do this. Surprise! Turret time! It's a good spook, no doubt, but I believe it gets too comfortable with that method. There's no security bot here for me to disable everything, so I can't get through. Oh wow, actually there's one right next to me. Oh wow, I can't get through there because I missed the keycard for the door that gets to the security panel. Brain explosion. I find myself not wanting to waste my time or ammo with these health code violations, so usually I don't mind sparing a health hypo or two to get past. And then forget about them, as I have to go back through the same area and get killed by them anyway. <laughs> Luckily, turrets are boringly slow at rotating, so if you're close enough and behind it, you can whack it back to robot hell. <laughs> I didn't know turrets had a martyrdom perk. Now all it's missing is the explosion of money. But don't worry, if you get caught dead by one of these, each area contains a quantum bio reconstruction device. Stolen from Bioshock, of course, these are basically your respawn stations. Register with one of these, and you have insurance of infinite life. And in the fashionable style of grim world building. On most decks, you'll find a quantum bio reconstruction device. You'll need to interface with each machine locally to provide a quantum entanglement sample. Once you do that, the device will be able to rebuild your body essentially from scratch. It's not pleasant, but it's preferable to slow decomposition. W wait, so if you die, your fibers are reconstructed, reviving you with no memory loss? This is insane technology. No wonder Trioptimum is a conglomerate. <gasps> Oh, but it costs money. But that means if you're broke, oh no, it's a system made to purge the poor out of existence. So here's the genre for my original video game idea. I'm alive, but now only with the side effect of... Ah, nothing like a little Pavlovian response to trigger my fight or flight. Audio at times can be just as dense as the decor in 3D space. Rooms are accompanied by different noises, differing the functionality of equipment, the twinkling of the terminals, wiring buzzing through hot vents, broken tech would bark out its last dying breath? Does electricity breathe? Oh, and whatever these pumps do, they clatter. That's nice. All of this overlaid by the base hum of the Von Braun itself. Again, it's stuff that's incredibly easy to take for granted, as they are placed so naturally, you never really think about it. If a piece of a world was moving, and it didn't produce any noise at all, you'd begin to question it. Though seemingly strapped for time and development, all sounds except the ship's hum become less frequent in later stages. Though you are still rarely in a silent, soundproof area. What the fu- I believe this is because later in the game, there are less objects in the game that would tend to produce noise, so there just isn't any at all. But geniusly enough, the solution to this was to rely on the sound of the enemies. Oh no 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 no! And that's just enough to keep you on your toes. I see this as a clever alternative.
After all, when you hear that turret spin up, you know you're running. Not to mention the music that's playing, cause well, it's music. It does a very good job at breaking the ice. The game introduces itself in a dark, atmospheric tone, but soon after you realize the soundtrack's composer had just finished watching The Matrix. I mean, you just got out of a Bosch freezer, got amnesia, shit's blowing up all around you and all you can hear is... Though there are some areas in the game that are accompanied by diegetic hums of the ship. Which is a good use of downtime from the constant barrage of 2011 Skrillex. Despite opinions on both sides, System Shock without music is unique to the experience of System Shock with music. The soundtrack and diegetic ambience provide different atmospheres that work justifiably in their own ways. No music entails a raw sense of vulnerability where your ears perk at every distinct detail. With the music on, things are more energetic, carefree, and can help provide a faster paced, arcade-ish experience. It just depends what mood you're in. I do appreciate how flexible the score is, as it comprises strengths of both hardcore techno but progression in the game, the music evolves into this passive, pulsating, low-frequency sound, instilling dread as the ship gets dimmer, where new mutated amalgamations form, and you begin to uncover remains of corrupt crewmates. Which is like, yeah, a total buzzkill. Hey man, you're looking down. Have this Jaeger bomb. We're playing effects to it next. <laughs> the score was composed by three fellas, Josh Randall being the lead, with the colonoscopy used as reference for a later stage. Oh, these graphics look like shit. And supposedly co-composed by Ramin Jwadi, Jwad, <clears throat> and Eric Brosius, because he's our bro. And you could really feel the diversity seeping between the three as the musical styles collide in the same world. But for now, I want you to focus eyes on this guy, Ramin, or Ramin. He went on to compose music for shows and movies a lot of us are familiar with. He's the man who is responsible for that inescapable opening theme for a show with a fanbase that wish it had the same look as Sonic fans. Now, I ain't saying that System Shock made his career, but System Shock made his career. Personally, my initial assumption of System Shock 2 was that it were a dark, slow game, something I was familiar with, like Alien Isolation. But once that superficial mask slipped, oh, I was exposed. The music began to have this unusual yet fitting place here. One of my favorite tracks is the first version of Hydroponics. It's an aura of progression shrouded by uncertainty, and its fast pace runs parallel with the horrific nature of this flaw, as the player is found panting and sweating as they run through the corridors, Oh, oh, I said it, I said it! All of this broken up by moments of distortion before returning to normalcy. It helps illustrate how dire and uncontrollable the situation is as you venture into the source of it all. But all of that hits a symphonic brick wall as you venture into the fridge at 3am to get some eggs, you know, as you do. But then the loading screen interrupts the music where an unnerving scene begins. With signs of struggle, the floor is terraformed by annelid colonies. This area switches the tone in one swift right hook trailing more breadcrumbs to the mystery, leaving only the corpses of Hydro crewmates who appear to have seen some shit right before death. Judging by their faces, they probably had the rebirth mod installed. A commendable work ethic, I guess. Notice how NPCs or the bodies of the NPCs are color-coded, allocating them to roles on the ship. Though it's subtle, I feel it would have been better if the uniform was structurally different not just a splash of paint. White space-suited medsci crewmates could be dressed in something as simple as a lab coat. Instead of red, engineering crewmates could be equipped with hazard suits. You know, the ones that you could pick- Oh god, why is it so big? Every deck inhabits its own cultures and leaves footprints of its workforce, whether that be one of the many identical offices with minor personal arrangements, such as orange juice, or the ghostly pre-premonitions, that's a term now. Throughout the game, you never meet anyone face to face. It serves this isolating feel as the only beings you meet are the ones that are attempting to convert you to their space religion. Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? <laughs> An all-powerful being, sharing the same thoughts and philosophy, powered by AT&T's new 10G telepathy communication plan. Opposing them is considered sacrilege of the hive mind, but don't let them know that they are wrong and you are right. As for the ghosts mentioned earlier, ghosts are one of the narrative gears in this machine. The game doesn't want to call them that though, they're sophisticated. You might witness some strange phenomena. Your R-grade cyber rig has an experimental perception enhancement that can theoretically detect residual psychic emanations. These emanations traditionally come from the recently dead. Literature might call them ghosts. 
I call them self-hypnotic defects in the R-grade unit. Ooh, and I call them transparent people. Apparitions spreaded throughout the game often appear around dead bodies, given an interesting yet sometimes unintegral backstory, but sometimes they will hint at game mechanics. God damn, somebody's hacked into this thing again. Contrary to those, actually, sometimes you will see the visions of the people you've been listening to on your PDA. Better yet, following the story of someone in hopes of finding them so you can escape together, only for it all to end in a sour pile of dread as you tower over the corpse. Stuff like that excels at painting this picture of how alone you are. I've always found something unsettling about recorded media of people who are no longer among the living. That also applies to games. It's like an artificial extension of them, on a constant loop for the rest of time. The animations of the emanations in the stations can appear to be stiff at times. They move slow, mouths don't move, and they have a thousand mile stares. They're like puppets rather than people. Oh my god, what if that's the underlying message of the corporate world? The enemy AI are passable, being more expressive because the animators would have spent more time on common animations that would play in correspondence to the player. Whereas, the apparitions play scripted sequence on rails as exposition, not gameplay. And if they look this bad when they're apparitions or when they're dead, you can only imagine what they look like when they were alive. Speaking of ghosts, around the command control area, there's a ghost that appears to be the exact same model as Goggles, the player. No way. They're not gonna get me. They're not gonna change me. Rachel? Kids? I'm sorry. Oscar goes too. You could chalk this up as a bit of laziness to make up for time, as really, you never see your character in game apart from the cutscenes from the beginning and the very end. And chances are that it's so spaced out you would have forgotten what your player model looks like. So it just makes use of the player's perspective. There's speculation on forums discussing what ifs on why the soldier did this. Half of me wants to believe that they did this on purpose so it's left up to interpretation, but then again, this could have been done inadvertently. So the developers could just say, yep, <laughs> we totally meant that. Take the script, burn it. Don't let anyone see this. I like to believe he tried to kill himself after knowledge of what everyone looks like because they are just so. Ugh. Fontaine will find you. Hey, fuck Fontaine. You don't fuck Fontaine. Fontaine fucks you. Fuck me. Fuck you. Commonly, you'll run into upgrade units. Spread throughout the game, you'll discover them bunched together. The usual placement being shortly after you enter newer decks. The currency they require are exclusive to cybernetic modules. Modules are earned by doing your main objectives, so as you progress through the corporate ladder, you become stronger as the weaker gets weaker. There aren't really any side objectives in this game, apart from one missable objective, but I'll touch on that later, it's spoiler territory. There are alternative methods to finding the modules, sometimes on corpses, laying around the world. First is the stats unit. Stats is a base attribute. For anyone who was born past 2010, this is like the special from Fallout, except instead it's Sepak. So pack of these nuts. No. Upgrading any of these is more for the purpose of bigger and better. The other upgrade units act more as a ticket of any sorts, being unlocks over upgrades. I find tech to be the best to purchase early on for safe insurance, just so you won't be locked out of modifying your pistol into an improved state. Sorry mate, we know you're 60 years in, but you need a level of 10 modify to improve your life. The exception here would be maintenance, which increases how much repair is applied to a weapon in a single use. And yes, weapons in this game do degrade with use, but thankfully they don't combust blowing off my fingers. This is also where you can upgrade your research points, which is very beneficial for ammo consumption. Enemy corpses will frequently have materials that, upon researching those materials, you gain a better understanding of the enemy, allowing you to deal more damage as a result. Materials require chemicals, which can be found in the chemical storeroom. Every room comes with a log displaying the inventory, which is insanely useful, as some materials you find in the later game will require you to backtrack to go to earlier areas to get the chemicals needed. A small price to pay for such a commodity, and I've seen fetish go into the thousands. Oh no, I'm in a chemical room and it doesn't have what I need. Time to look at my PDA and see which deck has the chemicals I need. I like cooking one of those. A big one. one of Did you learn nothing from my chemistry class? Chemical needed. It is tedious, but the returns are beneficial, because hoarding chemicals is unideal when the inventory gets full insanely fast, and there are way better things to hold on to. There are just as many chemicals in this game that don't have a use than the ones that do. Psionic Disciplines wields an overwhelming choice of abilities. Just read them and see what other fancy word sounds useful. Weapons are for weapons. They make you a killer. Death. 
It's a shame that investing here does nothing other than allowing you to handle weapons like it's Judge Dredd. Oh, that bloody crap! <laughs> For example, I would have loved to see if investing in energy would increase energy battery capacity for the powered armor or energy weapons themselves. Or for the heavy attribute to make you just a bit more resistant to explosive damage. Though I complain about it, the devs already do something like this. If you put points into research, you're not just removing the level cap, but are also increasing the rates of speed research processes. Which, with the lowest level of research, the longest item to process takes 1 hour and 20 minutes. That is real time, not in game. It's something with miniature benefits used to encourage players to pick attributes with a reason other than Ooh, that gun looks interesting, but I can't use it. Time to save up for 5 hours only to use this one weapon. And even so, sometimes upgrades may overlap with each other. For example, notice how there's a blank space here in weapons? That's because you need to research a specific material, which will unlock one extra weapon type. But you'd be incapable of researching all those materials because you put all of your points into standard instead of research. Haha, <laughs> now you can't enjoy the spoils of a thorn branch. <laughs> Right now is an incredible time to be a sound designer. System Shock 2 is a deep game, making you more aware of your volatile spending habits. Oh, Dad, please stop buying standard upgrades. We haven't eaten for five days. No, can't you see? I'm unlocking the AR-15. Even light years away from Earth, you cannot escape economic inflation. So I recommend saving up before making purchases. You're warned that these are scarce, but in later areas, you're rewarded more and more in higher quantities. As the more upgrades you buy, the more expensive they get. As soon as you max out, you instantly cause a great depression. Oh yeah, there's also an additional unit, the OS Upgrade Machines. They offer traits with specific uses at no cost. My favorite is cybernetically enhanced. Double the drug use, double the social validation. Some traits are useful as the benefits they offer are acquirable elsewhere. And pick wisely, because in your entire 16 hours of this game, there are only four of them. Four. And you cannot undo what you have chosen. Think of this as the occasional trait upgrades you'd earn in Fallout New Vegas, minus the skill requirements. Oh wow, so many Fallout comparisons. I can't believe that Fallout was inspired by System Shock, the proud spiritual successor to- Wait, no, uh, no, get out. There are also softwares scattered around, being a subsidiary of the tech upgrades. There are different softwares that have different purposes, one of which just makes this bold statement on player skill need less skill. Again, easiest comparison with these are the bobbleheads from Fallout but instead for a chance-based minigame bearing the appearance of a boring ram stick. At least mine has RGB lighting. Shock 2's hacking is more of a chaotic evil of RNG compared to other hacking minigames like, let's say, Bioshock. Oh no, I'm out of specific tube. <laughs> But it can be more forgiving if you invest into the cyber affinity skill, which just increases your chances of passing. Hacking, repairing, modifile just boils down to press every square until you connect three highlighted squares, avoiding the red ones of course. You can retry if need be, but only for a small fee. You can test your luck by pressing the red squares, but the odds are not always in your favor. Failing these will either result in tripping the security alarm, which warrants a quick load, or somehow Ted Kaczynski finally became accustomed to modern technology. But as we all know, gambling is the greatest sin. Up there next to watching this video with Adblock. Oh, and holding hands before marriage. Join me brothers in safe scumming, saving your nanites in defiance of the Trioptimum Corporation as the shops want your nanites. In return, you can have some backward to get seriously slumped off that earwax, my slimes. The higher the decks you venture, the more expensive the shops become. They don't like it when you're shot, so maybe try growing another two feet. You can hack the replicators, the shops, lowering the price if need be, because eat the rich, until you become rich, then eat the rich out? But since I'm a hypo addict, I steal my neighbor's IKEA plant pots, recycling them, receiving government benefits for keeping the station green. While System Shock's competitors focused on evolving the way a story is told, a fast pace giving you an unlimited amount of weapons and tools, System Shock focused on establishing character progression, player choice, and allowing for different ways of interactivity. It was breaking the norm, ahead of its time, as Ken Levine says. It, I, I think what happens sometimes with, with Looking Glass games is generally, and I think you'll probably agree with me on this, tend to be a little bit ahead of their time. Yeah. And I think Underworld, when the, I remember the first time I played Underworld, I looked at it and it took me a while for my mind to get around the kind of freedom and the kind of interactions you can have in that product. Right. You think back to that time, there was nothing. Nothing. We give so many tools to the player and let the player experiment so much, it's it, it's kind of overwhelming at first. Yeah, I, I 
I'm completely excited about System Shock 2, and I'll, I'll get to talking to you about that in just a second. For an interview in 1999, that is some sexy, sexy mic quality. System Shock may not have had as much public notoriety as it does now, but at the time, developers did pay attention. It definitely in some way influenced the way games are made today. Tell you what, easiest comparison. Look at these two games and tell me what you notice differently. One of them is a better designed game, and the other is an Australian man's wife. Okay, they're incomparable when it comes to quality, because they triumph in their own way stylistically and mechanically. Half-Life 1, released a year before, does have an interface. It keeps to a linear, minimalist style that only really reacts to single button prompts for situational moments. System Shock 2 excels the interface race with the grid-based inventory, allowing you to micromanage your weapons, change their fire mode, pick and choose implants at your will, play smart so you don't get lost for the 20th time, and read emails. Yay, more tax forms! And Ken Levine himself shares that people were worried that System Shock 2 was going to dumb down the interface from the first game. And we had a very, we had a very similar problem in Shock 2. I think a lot of people have been worried about System Shock 2 in the sense that they were worried that we would try to dumb it down in any way. Right. And in fact, System Shock 2 is a more complex, more rich, a richer, a deeper game than, than Shock 1. And he's right, for sure. System Shock 1 appears intricate, but is it accessible or useful? System Shock 1's interface was aesthetically suffocating to look at. Five hours of this and your frontal lobe would just liquefy itself. Its unlabeled tabs makes it more difficult to navigate than an eagle's feelings. Oh fuck. What does any of this mean? Well, as a wise woman once said, Pull the lever, crunk. It takes a while to get past the initial acid trip of it all, and over time it becomes a little bit more understandable and more of a UI that tends to rely on muscle memory, and dare I say, <laughs> reading. Anyway, the visual of the interface now is actually understandable, bearing a smaller yet lengthy learning curve that takes time to marinate with the player. And it really sells the cyber implants aesthetic, with metallic borders connecting to each other when every new tab appears. Although, this little nub here, I don't see the purpose of this. Clicking on it is the same as clicking anywhere to tab out. And I'm not sure if in the release version of this game you had to click on this specifically to resume out of the inventory screen. Your goggles analyzes everything it hovers over, displaying what said item is. Mmm. And occasionally, some subtle product placement. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Some areas can feel like a maze, but the map overlay is surprisingly good. It's straight to the point, marks points of interest like the replicators and recharge stations, and even annotated the sectors and bulkheads, which are the doors on the ship. These serve to load an area. Ooh, even the option of a mini-map. The only downside to this is the level of verticality on the deck, where you can follow these by numbers. It's a little confusing at first, but it just takes some paying attention. I know. What a shame. Honestly, I didn't know what numbers these purpose served until I had played at least 30 hours of this game. But honestly though, I prefer this technique of telling the player what flaw they're on compared to whatever this layout is. It's like a 2017 thumbnail. Even the markers you place can be renamed. So for example, if you have an item you can't pick up but want to go back two hours later, you can mark it, name it, and it will actually wait for you. Items don't despawn in this. Though, there are no limit to how many markers you can place. No spoilers, but later in the game, you reach an area where there is no map layout, so you have to pay more attention to your path. Which seems to be a redundant design choice because removing the map implies you're not supposed to know where to go. But that whole idea is just debased when you realize you can spam as many markers as you want, leaving breadcrumbs if you for some reason have to retrace your steps. Either it's that design choice or it's a we ran out of time, sorry feature. Credit to Mr. Thanos from the forums for that joke. Wait, aren't you dead? Sure, you can just not place markers. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? This could have been fixed through either limiting usage of markers or only being able to place markers through an item pickup with one-time uses. Like how Dark Souls has the prism stones and no, this isn't the Dark Souls of shooters, it's actually the system shock of Dark Souls. What the fuck does that mean? After all, I don't think there's a definitive answer to why there's no layout in this area. At first, Shock 2's interface was overwhelming. Your progression through the game plays a heavy part in understanding and navigating its mechanics, as so does any game. But being a new player, it felt like a lot was dumped on me, so I just turned towards the biggest buttons I could find. <laughs> Though, developers have learned from this, and in time have become better at player direction, teaching players how their games work, usually through the method of drip-feeding their mechanics, which has made it less of a whiplash. <laughs> Also, everything is real-time. The game never pauses. It's considered a basic structure of gameplay today, but there's still some appreciation to be had depending on what stakes and compromises there are. Bioshock cells seethe because you can't just run up to a turret and hack it, freezing time. 
And to be quite frank, being Swiss cheese sounds like a really bad fate. The compromise to this is to disable the security, removing hostility from the turret, then you can hack it. I'll use the remote circuitry manipulation side, hacking from a safe position. Anyway, I wonder what logs I have to catch up on. I was just talking to him and this cyborg came up oh. behind him and... How about that for a segue? Yeah, enough of this and you'll unlock the sixth sense for self-destructing robots. Please. Sixth, sixth, sixth sense. Sixth, ah, uh, shit, I can't say. This game is very good at catching you off guard. Sometimes though a bit confusing, enemies might just spawn out of nowhere despite you clearing the area. I'm sorry. I even had a moment where a hybrid just materialized right in front of me. This place now, or we will at least they aren't Night City law enforcement and do some Naruto anime shit on you. Naruto when he's shippered in? I don't know, I haven't, I haven't watched the show. If you're craving some con sweeper or some recreational narcotic use, make sure that you're in a position away from narcs. If you're in the heat of the moment, to save time and awkwardness, you can bind hotkeys on specific items to your liking. There are so many items to pick up in this game. All of them, I think, have a use one way or another. Like the plant pots. If you have a recycler, that's free nanites. Even the orange juice, you can drink it for health or you can recycle it for some nanites. Why are these monkeys carrying a bag of Doritos? Can. Hmm, extra health. Arby's, we have the chips. My first playthrough, I collected everything to ensure I didn't miss out on anything. Yeah, I'm sure those six monkey brains gotta be of good use in the the dark matter market? The inventory is grid based. Everything takes up one square, but weapons usually take up three vertical slots and armor takes up a square of four slots. And your inventory can get full very quickly. So it's best to adapt to the area that you're in. You got radiation hypos from engineering, but now you're in hydroponics. Ah! Might as well drop that for toxin hypos. Implants are a must for exploring too. A quick example of the chemistry of these, if you picked either Marines or Navy, then a worm mined implant is perfect. Rather than getting hit for four points on your health, one of every four hit points are subtracted from Psy, which is perfect if you're not using any Psy disciplines, because then its purpose is turned into a shield bar. There's a good amount of freedom offered to cater to specific builds, and it's extensions like these which just add much more depth to the Dark Abyss that is System Shock 2's mechanics. My favorite build is what many could call their Achilles heel. Or as I like to say, athlete's foot, swift boost implant, agility buff from the Psy, and finally a speed booster hypo. And you have yourself an Olympic suicide. <laughs> This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. <clears throat> <laughs> to me, it's just genius how a toxic worm will do less damage than a polygonal leaf from an IKEA plant. As much as a meme that is, it's great for running past turrets and enemy projectiles. Implants do have a battery life, so make sure you pack some AA Duracells or use a recharge station. There isn't a shortage of weapons and ammo found in enemies, but chances are they'll always be broken, so I either repair them or look for one that's in usable condition. Melees don't degrade, but guns do, so keep an eye on those. If it's getting low, you can drag a maintenance tool on the weapon to extend its lifespan. Majority of weapons, you can switch between two fire modes, but commonly it's more of, do you want to shoot one bullet for a reasonable amount of damage? Or do you want to shoot multiple at once for a little more damage? So I just stick to the default setting as ammo is fairly scarce. There are exceptions with some more nuanced choices. The fusion cannon's second firing mode, death mode, deals more damage, but its projectile is painfully slower. The grenade launcher's secondary enables the grenades to bounce for a moment before exploding, so that would require more strategy in timing. Don't worry, I have experience. If you're interested in some more basic uninspired choices, look at the viral prolificators modes. Do you want to shoot at mutated humans or do you want to shoot at an amalgamation of worms? Pick one, but less about risk reward talk. How about just reward? Okay, th then earn it. 
If you're a charter and a bit of a kleptomaniac, you might be lucky enough to come across tools for modification, which is just a boring word for upgrade. These are the French Epstein devices. No, not that one. Drag one of these bad boys onto a weapon and reap the benefits of seeing the funny number get higher, then looking up the wiki to see what you even did. Or if you're investing in tech, just cheat your way there, you grifter. I don't care. There's a huge range of weapons too. I actually haven't gotten around to trying all of them out yet. One of my favorites is the stasis field generator, which is great for crowd control, but it feels like a weapon you get as a hidden easter egg. Equipment can be graphically inconsistent, one weapon will appear detailed, the other will look like it's textured by the bucket tool of Microsoft Paint. The grenade launcher looks like I'm about to install piping for my water. The psionic amplifier is supposed to be this multi-tool capable of psychokinesis and forging weaponry, all through the power of a user's mental energy, and its model just doesn't illustrate the ingenuity of it. The wire that's implanted into the wrist is a nice touch, creating this sense of unnaturalness, but other than that, it looks like I'm about to go bowling. The wrench is one of the first weapons you'll be using, and for a decent amount of time during your playthrough. I love it. It never degrades, it saves me ammo, and usually stuns the enemies when you hit them. There's even a spirit level near the bottom, which is an interesting detail, but... I never really liked how skinny and fragile this looked. The build just looks flat with no depth. Its small appearance puts up a seemingly impossible fight. It's a step up from System Shock 1's stick, and it's definitely better than Half-Life 1's crowbar, but I think my issue with it, and for the majority of the weapons in this game, are the animations. Oh, I didn't even mention the animations. It's too slow. Its pathetic speed doesn't really propose any impact. Half-Life 1's crowbar may look worse, but its cartoonish speed actually imposes a sense of damage. And I know I've used this game as an example a lot, but their releases were a year apart. Come on, I, th I think that's fair. The wrench glides across the screen and lacks recoil. When you land hits, the swing stops and resets to its default position. No bounce at all. The response you get is just a hit marker sound from Modern Warfare 2. Um, <laughs> And sometimes, it can be very unforgiving with how accurate you have to center your target. Thing is, one year earlier had more energy, you swung in more than one direction, every hit landed made the next swing faster. There is a heavy overhead swing attack, though you have to unlock that through the OS machine, and it deals an extra two hit points. But can I also mention, what is this? His hand is a literal sphere. The Irrational team definitely improved on this, I mean, look at Bioshock. Despite the team adapting to improvements of the graphical norm in the 2000s, the wrench moves faster, it now has idle animations rather than being a static prop. Each swing trails behind a subtle blur, breaking the sound barrier, and a variety of directional swings. Though I do wish it would have more of a visual impact, it still looks like it glides by, but other than that, the design itself of the wrench has more girth. It looks like it actually hurts, you're not gonna see Andrew Ryan breathe on it and see it snap in two. The guns and systems Shock aren't as offensive compared to melees, but still have minimal visual appeal. And one of the more noticeable things with the guns in System Shock is how lightweight and lifeless everything is. When you turn, there isn't any weapon sway to catch up following the direction you're looking. And when you shoot, I don't even think there is much of an animation for recoil. Some weapons sell the effect better than others, but... I just fired a deadly explosive. This hulking mass of metal is equivalent to a snot-nosed spitballer. The weapons themselves lack response, but the screen shake? I'll get to that in a moment. The lead game designer at Ubisoft, former lead game designer, Stanislav Kostiuk, shares this sentiment when reviewing, oh, it's Bioshock, isn't it? Bioshock score mechanics are functional, and that's about it. It all feels so floaty. The difference between Electroshock of level 1 and Electroshock of level 3 is purely technical, statistical. You don't actually feel that it's more powerful. No screen shake, no slight stopping of movement when you cast it to feel the punch, nothing. Yes, they do have different effects, but there are no game feel elements that make you feel the distinction. By the way, you should definitely take his word more into account. He knows what he's talking about compared to some neckbeard sat inside his bedroom talking about System Shock 2 pretending that he's some critiquer. Since later projects have been roped into this argument, it would be unfair if I didn't mention they eventually got the visual responses right. I don't care what you say about Bioshock Infinite. That is the best visually looking shock game there is. You. I will fight you. Anyway, back to complaining. One of the most annoying things about the recoil in this game for me is the screen shake, if you can even call it that. I understand it's to put up a challenge, making you more cautious, sparing ammo further, driving the sense of vulnerability and scarcity, which is great, but rigor mortis is awkward. 
every shot and a screen adjusts a bit high in an instantaneous frame. If you're running with a side build, you can use neural reflex dampening to momentarily lower your recoil. Ultimately, how much recoil you experience is down to what weapons you're using and how much agility points you have. It's beneficial, sure, but makes firing appear so much more lifeless. It sacrifices a visual response for statistical advantages. This is fine, I think this is an interesting use of the stats. However, I don't think maxing out agility should outright turn you into a naval Seabus. What confuses me more is that it's inconsistent. The grenade launch clip earlier was on five agility points. The launcher on one agility point looks like this. See? You see? Well, you don't see it? He moves! Right there! Wait, wait! Right there! A possible solution to the weapon and screen kick would be to have a sense of momentum. Weapon and screen recoil need to work together in a good balance in order to sell a promising effect. A weapon should behave how it looks, paired with the reaction of its surroundings. A pistol is gonna behave a bit more babyish compared to a fucking cannon. Which sounds simple, but then making a stat to dampen recoil, then brings in an extra buffet of issues for each weapon to keep that effect somewhat there, whilst also serving the purpose of weapon control. Which, the more I speak in this inane section of the video, makes me realize why a mechanic like this hasn't appeared in recent titles. But this is purely a fantasy of mine. You think irrational and Looking Glass are going to watch this video and think, yeah, he's right, it's been 22 years, let's exit our graves and band back together to fix this issue. Despite gaming's technological and developer advances evolving tenfold in that time, so those issues are already fixed. Of course you think that. <laughs> The sound design for these guns are fine. I feel that they could have had a bit more kick to supplement that sense of force. The shotgun is noticeably awkward. Every shot is followed by a pump sound. But ultimately, no pump animation is played. Some weapons are more effective against certain enemy types. The EMP rifle being for mechanical or cyborgs. The shotgun being better for flesh-based enemies. The camera destroyer. I like how it pushes the player to make use of all of their weapons. But in spite of that, an enemy's weakness isn't exclusive to a weapon that you may not have enough to research for, let alone have inventory space for. There is a second solution, which also serves player choice. Oh my god, have I mentioned that enough yet? You may have noticed that the ammo in the bottom right has changed color over the past hour of this video. These can be cycled through. The ammo types will have different names depending on the weapon, but usually share the same principle. Red for Flesh enemies, armor piercing for metallic, cyborg mechas and nuisances, and blue is standard, dealing minimal damage, you will treat this one with no care. But it is great for cameras, armor piercing was introduced pretty straightforwardly. Surprise turret. Gotta get to cover. Oh, there's armor piercing rounds. So the game's telling me to use this on the turret? God, this gun is awful. Why is it doing no damage? These are the ammo types for the standard weapons. Exotic and heavy weapons require totally unique ones. The grenade launcher has five different types, though you're so used to the color coding that you end up using disrupt on mechs when really you should be using EMP. Proximity is my favorite because I keep forgetting that I placed them about five hours ago. Ammo found from picking up a pre-existing weapon you already have is a convenient addition. That's why System Shock 2 has you manually unloading the broken weapons you pick up because a game without a few extra steps isn't an immersive sim. Well, some say Red Dead Redemption 2 is the last Looking Glass spiritual successor. Of course, if your inventory is full, you'll have to make some sacrifices. Historic problems do call for some historic solutions. <laughs> They even adopted the reloading from System Shock 1. But even for Shock 2's time, I doubt anyone would have pressed this button to reload their weapon. Now is a good time to bring up the side disciplines. Pressing B doesn't cycle through, but opens up a menu. So there's a lot of premeditation to practice. And thinking is very, very difficult. There is a set of hotkeys if you wanted to cycle through them. F1 cycles tier one, F2 cycles tier two, F3 vice versa, you know, you get the idea. It takes some getting used to, but it's not too much of a problem, honestly. I never use 
these hotkeys, but missing functionality is a small price to pay for a Reddit hobby. Ugh. A favorites wheel would be useful in this scenario. It kind of makes me wish the developers took note of award-winning games like Dishonored. I mean, come on guys, they were so ahead of you. There are five tier pages, which can be bought in any order, and what's available varies. You're not going to unlock all of these without console commands. It's just way too expensive. A majority have a good use, but some definitely feel redundant or that you'd get better results elsewhere. Some of these can be a bit confusing, so of course, the wiki explains them clearly in an approachable fashion. The first discipline, cryokinesis, allows you to project your opinions onto others, causing their nervous system to malfunction. Using pyrokinesis means being the reincarnation of Rose God, instantly killing those without regain for men. But there are useful, non-offensive disciplines like healing. The only spell I used in Oblivion. Hold down past this yellow box in the gauge, the longer lasting the effect is. As for damage, you would deal more. You get the math. Releasing the box, get more bang for your telepathic monkey brain. Just make sure you don't overheat. They might mistake your brain for fried food. He'll figure it out eventually. I love the design of the enemies. Comprised of multiple colonies of annelids, reminiscent of a literal parasite, they serve a singular being. Themselves. Named the many, they are a mutagenic virus hive mind that is ever expanding their biomass. And in gruesome detail too. Like that one season of Stranger Things with the rats and the people. They use telepathic mind control to allow unsuspecting victims infected. to be infected. Those infected influence others to join them. And all in one being. Those who object... They die. Keep in mind, this predated social media. Here's a picture of the biomass on the Rickenbacker, the security ship attached to the Von Braun. The reason the ship's security is against you is because the many used one of the pawns who, prior to the many's control, was the only one known to hack into the ship's AI, Xerxes, making him sing copious amounts of Maybe Elvis Presley songs as a harmless prank, with frustrations exhausted by Marie Delacroix. Some idiot hacked into the primary data loop last night and made Xerxes sing Elvis Presley songs for three hours. What would happen if someone with a real agenda got into him? Yeah, a real agenda. Anyway, what's up with old games in Elvis Presley? This was the perfect candidate to breach the ship's security. The keys were handed to the many on a silver platter, which is like the best luck you can have as a sentient virus. Anyway, a lot of things can be easily explained because of the many's undefeatable ability. Everything aboard is essentially mind controlled by the many. That's really just the easiest explainer for anything that happens ever. I forgot to file my taxes. Oh wow, just so it happens that all my money is offshore. I don't know what this is. Glory to the many. Though the overall design of these enemies are not unusual. It's a common trend to fight characters that were people once who then became mutated by some alien pathogen. Try talking to a Kanye fan. Hey, good morning, Kanye. That shouldn't have scared me. You observe the evolution of the mutations and the annelids throughout the game, and the physical manifestations are plentiful, nesting themselves in unthinkable places to survive. Ah, uh, you were in there? Gaining superworm DNA alteration, jumping at least 12 feet high, I thought doping was illegal in the Von Braun. They wander aimlessly throughout the labyrinth, waiting for your presence, breaking up quiet time whilst you're searching. <laughs> Alerting the player, either through indecisive idle speech or inhumane growls. And the lore of the enemies in System Shock is really what compelled me to make this video. I love it when a game gives detailed sub-stories dedicated to the unimportant characters made to attack the player. It really gives a medium's universe a sense of life. It removes from the waves of faceless enemies the game wants you to shoot. But backstory gives you a better understanding of once was and how they came to be, either through ultimatums or misfortunes, which then explains their motives and our purposes. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to join civil protection just to get a decent Meal. You know, like, the thing that makes a character... Uh, world building? For this reason, it's not the superficial appearance of a character that makes them so terrifying, but the story behind their name. What, you think this low polygonal monkey is scary? You think this brain power of a fucking Queen's Gambit is scary? Oh no, T1's A4! 
I, I have no idea how to play chess or what a queen's gambit is. Monkeys were actually nearly cut from the game. It seemed to be a stupid design, but ultimately worked out in the end. Though, they definitely feel shoehorned in, for lack of a better word. But a harmless inclusion. There's no reason for their presence in space on the Von Braun, but it serves the narrative of the inaneness of Trioptimum, as one of the crewmates literally questioned the point of a voyage with monkeys. Whose idea was it to bring 150 chimpanzees on board anyway? The interest of science? The poor chimps. They come on board for the most historic mission of all time, and they end up being chopped into little pieces in the name of progress. Despite the questionable place on the Von Braun, they did play a huge red flag into warning about the many's existence, alongside male pattern baldness. Ever since we reached Tau Ceti, the lab monkeys have been acting strangely. I mean, the entire group stood up on their legs and howled. This wasn't just a random display. It was a protest. Scientists among the Von Braun were conducting experiments, testing the psionic ability of a monkey under harsh conditions implied by Grassy. It suggested the psionic abilities were strengthened by the closer contact with the many's aura, provoking a spiritual awakening, realizing that, wow, I hate people now, now releasing a bottled up resentment for the mutilating experiments and vivisections performed on them. Their brains expanded and exposed a mark from the scientists' cruel damages, possessing intelligence surpassing their racial successes. Man, <laughs> but still dribble incoherence. <laughs> At a sidetrack, there's even an Easter egg in the late game where if you throw a basketball into the net, the monkeys will contact you asking you to give banana. And the best part about this is that you can only get the basketball before you even enter the training course at the start of the game. After that, you have to carry it throughout the rest of the game up until that point in recreational, which is like a good 10 hours away. <laughs> Contrary to most media of zombies, they are confused, beg for death, apologize and warn you despite their hostility. Like the human is somewhere still inside them. This has been explored and theorized before in other mediums, but it's not so much present. Unaware of their own conscious, they demand you to join them. Join gloating their goals and self-gratifying their greatness. It's the process of who once possessed that body is now becoming the passenger as the new host takes place, merging thoughts but ultimately taking over ones prior. What happened to me? There's still some poor soul fighting for control, begging for an end. Eventually, the individual becomes many. Ooh, poetic. And who knew that in the 90s, they were up to date with epic savvy tech way ahead of its time. The cyborg midwife is undoubtedly my favorite uncommon common enemy out of a game. There's not much of a person left from the collarbone down. Skin that would protect parts of the face are missing, down to nearly a skeletal anatomy. Only the hair and eyes stay intact. It's some gruesome stuff and designs of other enemies like hybrids were fairly tame before this. Despite the graphical capacity of the game, encountering this for the first time was horrifying. The concept art helps define the loss of humanity. Of course, in this version, she didn't have the Ian from Smash Fade. Besides Besides, it's like there's this unwritten baseline if you're creating a horror game in the 90s that its gruesome attempts would still hold up. That's why there's a decent amount of PS1 styled horror games that are being released. That era of graphical limitations possess the keys to an uncanny, mangled, low poly world of monsters. They don't look real, they're out of world like. And so there's something disturbing about that sharp edged, low resolution, skinless face. She can be heard by metallic whirs and stomping feet, speaking through mangled speech, flesh distorted by electricity. She'll reassure herself of her little ones. Sometimes even humming to hush them, as someone would a baby. Despite being caring, she's ultimately brutal to those who pose a threat. They will taunt you, showing you what it's like to kill. Their deaths sound like a corrupted audio file that was just salvaged because one of my hard drives decided it should corrupt half my footage, so I had to re-record everything. Thank you, Western Digital. Midwives speak in a composed tone of voice, yet the words are contrary to that. The only time that they scream is when they're killed. This could be assumed to be the last human remains of the robot it had become. 
Midwives are the result of cyber modification surgery that had been illegal since the Citadel incident from System Shock 1. The midwife is reminiscent to the medside crewmate Erin Bloom. She fell victim to the deformities of being a wasteless cyborg. She recorded her suspicions, finding the schematics in which matched her DNA on her peer's desk, Mark Miller. No, not that one. Miller, supervisor of hydroponics, was among the first to be influenced by the many, and being a vessel for the thing, he pursued a guardian for the many's newborns. Please don't. I won't tell. I won't. Choose somebody else. I don't want to change. Please. Don't cry. Don't cry. Soon you'll be the mother of them all. If the many wanted more time to increase its ever-expanding self-being, it could have just hired a babysitter or installed YouTube kids on an iPad. I hear other parents do it, and it works just fine. She could be found in masses, caring for and protecting a nested cluster of annelid eggs, making sure the annelid worms come to fruition. And I know it seems so simple, but I think it's neat how there's noticeable increase of midwives in this area of eggs. It just suits the character's law and visualizes their purpose of existence. But okay, I gotta go on a nitpick tangent real quick. Originally, I thought the abundance of midwives was a cheap design choice because the midwives appear in frequent numbers with the same appearance. With Aaron Bloom, there could only really be one midwife, but in the end I excused it for gameplay's sake. However, again, through the narrative of MP3 files, Miller requested Angela Loessa, the nurse supervisor, to send 16 female nurses to him, now all assumed to be maimed by the modifications. Mark, what's going on? I thought it was weird when you asked me to send up 16 of my female staffers, but what have you done with them? But it's confusing because Miller admits to dedicating Bloom to be the mother. No other mention of developing mod mothers or midwives. So much attention is focused on Bloom that it feeds this appearance that she's the only midwife to exist. Soon you'll be the mother of them all. A perfect match because she has a child of her own back on Earth. I've chosen Nurse Bloom as the new mother to our children. She has a child of her own back on Earth. She knows what it is to care for the young. It's said that our mods were a prototype, but it's not elaborated on if the other midwives modifications were released from early access. Also, not to mention that she was the first cyborg midwife made by Miller, meaning the other nurses can't have been failed attempts because Miller wouldn't have gotten round to them yet. It's possible that the other midwives that appear in the game are the other nurses, but you'd have to use your imagination. They all look like Nurse Bloom. She's the only crewmate with that haircut. They are everywhere. Please just go back to Britain. I'm definitely throwing punches at straw here. It's nothing too deep. Loess's log on her 16 missing nurses are an explanation for the midwife's numerous appearance, despite the initial narrative being Bloom was the one for all children. Also, that being said, I feel some minor adjustments would have made her introduction more impactful if the first encounter with the midwife was actually Bloom. After doing a major amount of tasks in engineering, the game hints you to use the elevator in which you just powered on. So obviously the next thing you do is to ride it. This is where you encounter your first midwife. Why? This is the only one in engineering. The real Erin Bloom midwife is in hydroponics, and you know this because she carries her audio log. It would make more sense if she was the real first encounter. Or if not, just put the audio log on the one in engineering. <laughs> Hell, why not appear by some annelid eggs, where it makes contextual sense? Where in this area, you are greeted by decapitated corpses, a warning sign, no, a billboard, telling you not to fuck with their offspring. Despite everything I said, I still love this character's design. There's so many good aspects that it outweighs the, albeit, minute problems about the midwife. Also, speaking of low textures, the ghost premonition of her near the actual blue midwife looks nothing like her portrait and shares zero resemblance to any of the midwives. They couldn't even bother making a model for her. It's some completely different person. There is a graphics mod which changes her appearance, but I feel like it does a poor service for the midwife. It beautifies the character when its origin is supposed to be a mangled, horrific transformation, not Lara Croft Morphe makeup. Uh, she has boobs now. I don't know if it's hard to tell, but... I really like this enemy. Shock 2's environmental storytelling is phenomenal. Seeing the fate of someone through the use of the world surrounding them is always a treat. Oh, that sounds really bad. Especially when it's supplemented by audio logs, where the faces of those you are following are shown in their portraits. Oh my god, is that Crywank? Which is great because so far the staff I've seen physically feel like clones from an incubator. We only ever hear what happens, but are left to see the aftermath scarred into the environment. Left in mystery, you connect the dots as you listen to the recordings, describing what's final, 
their thoughts, their surroundings, capitulating, knowing there's no escape. They've killed my men, and now they've killed me. I'm holding my guts inside of me with both hands. I'm almost done. Resist! Humanity demands it. Resist! <sighs> <laughs> Rough night last night here, right? XD. <laughs> it's funny to say, but it's nice not seeing the occurrence. Ooh, I love a good murder story. There's this blurred line in between that the player feels, limited by only their imagination. I always say the best type of fear is fear of the unknown. With no exact answer, it's easy to instantly think up of the worst possible outcome, but also... Fear too. You're like free pizza at an anime convention. She can smell you, and she wants to consume you. It's like one of my Japanese animes. God, get me out of here. I've recorded a lock to this room. Maybe that will hold them. I'm heading to cargo, to cargo bay too. Come find me there. Shotgun discharges, moans, and a helpless person through a recording made a few days prior. You can only imagine how the scene played out. The fear in her eyes. Her eyes. <sighs> it's down to the methods of how someone plays a game. I remember seeing something like this in Bioshock recently, but not even long ago I would just brush past it, not paying attention to the story or the details the team put so much into. Your efforts are futile. That's the scariest thing about this, is the fact that Bioshock, the same designer, stole his own idea for their game. Good heavens! Audio logs will oftentimes offer instructions or hints, being able to play in the background. However, I wish there was a pause button because I cannot channel out what the other person is saying for the life of me. Install hardware override 45 end. You have not disappointed me. Transmitting cybernetic modules. But more importantly, the logs are what mostly drive the narrative in System Shock, pushing its story alongside the occasional cutscenes and email transitions from alive people sat in the passenger seat of this monster truck called System Shock 2. I am speaking like a fucking salamander from Mass Effect. <laughs> What? No, not a salamander, a salarian. I'm so stupid. <laughs> it's non-linear storytelling. The dates on the logs are not in chronological order, and it's sorted by which and when the logs are picked up. The PDA doesn't filter them by date, so it can be hard to follow initially. Tau 35? I wonder what that is. Who's this character they're talking about? Oh well, time to forget about them and get the context later in the game and still be confused. Audio logs serve to explain backstory but also hint at future events for the player. So far our work with the late model assassin cyborgs has gone remarkably well. The what assassins? We are not nearly as defenseless as the UNN stormtroopers might think. Oh, oh that's me! Some can even be downright terrifying with absolutely zero visual context. God don't do it! Please don't! Glory to the many. <laughs> I am a voice in their choir. Oh, <laughs> I reckon it's best to listen to these when there's some downtime, because the majority of the logs do bear purpose. It's revealing, so it's not something you want to brush by lightly. It's where characters' interactions with another are described. If you take the time to connect the dots, it's like unwrapping a gift. The gift being people who have suffered unthinkable deaths in the name of fiction. All these people died for you! What do you know? Bronson was right after all. I imagine I've got about an hour, but I'm tracking the, the transformations in the hope that the data might be useful to someone else. There are tumors on my leg and back. I can feel that thing inside me chewing, growing fat. If someone finds this, don't have any regrets about punching my clock. I was already gone. And it's ironic because I hear these audio logs and how creepy they are, and then I'm just completely reminded of the community and how between it and the game are positioned on polar opposite ends.
give you good advice. It's an experience to hear characters begin in confusion. Those who survived long enough to become more selfless, understanding, and confident in being an opponent. Despite never meeting those you hear, this development makes it feel like you met them fighting side by side. But yeah, the acting is a bit uneventful at times, despite the words being said. Last night I had the strangest dream. I was in my room by myself. But all of a sudden, there was not just me there, but a hundred me's, a thousand me's. The strange thing was, it felt good. I felt like I was part of something. A hundred of him sounds to be like an everyday thing, basing off of his monotone voice. A casual conversation while he's drinking beer with the boys. He also sounds like he wears a flannel shirt. The acting is fine overall, especially for the characters who are prominent, but for some side characters, they come off as apathetic or uncaring to their imminent demise. This could be just acceptance, but it's unusual for a collective of characters to share that trait. But looking through the credits, I believe these weren't recorded by voice actors, but members of the development team. It's not going to be a lot of people's speciality, so expect some off performances, and it doesn't shy away from the classical, oh no, he found me, ah, and then he dies. They're coming. Oh no. No. <laughs> Progressing through the game, after encountering some cutscenes, the audio logs begin to match up with the player's understanding, sounding less like a cicada cipher and more like a crossword. If you reach the very end of the game and decide to listen to the logs from earlier, they will hold a significantly different tone to how you originally perceived them. Everything after this point is going to be heavy in spoilers, but after the past hour and a half being quite literally littered with spoilers, I'm not sure if that warning matters anymore, Lamau. What is a drop of rain? Compared to the storm. What is a thought? What is a thought? Compared to a mind. Oh, I don't know Disco Elysium. You tell me. As established, the many are the main enemy force in this game, a new foe against the humans, but their history goes 42 years back. The Citadel. Attached to it, wildlife groves. A perfect environment to incubate a virus. All man made. Or should I say, computer made. Shodan had taken advantage of one of the four groves, the Beta Grove. Locking the grove away from the unsuspecting staff aboard the Citadel, Shodan began her work in bioengineering weapons. With no science degree and breaking the constitution, she was successful. Impressive. An accomplishment titled the V5 Mutagen Virus. Mutating humans into Reddit users. The protagonist, nameless hacker Neo, I'm in. Spots the infinite dangers in this power and jettisons the grove from the Citadel station into the vast pit of space. Quiet. 30 years go by. The mutagen abode continues to evolve, once being a microbe requiring hosts, now an annelid parasite species capable of telepathy. Don't ask how. From the grove's constant velocity in space, it eventually reaches planet Tau Ceti 5, where it laid waiting. Twelve years later, the Von Braun, thanks to its faster than light technology, reaches a close proximity with the planet within five months of its launch. They began receiving distress signals nearby. So the security detail, the Rickenbacker aboard the Von Braun, momentarily depart from the voyage, changing course in hopes of discovering extraterrestrial life. Getting brownie points for all the credit. What are mere lives compared to good boy points? You must be joking! Within telepathic reach, the commanders of the Rickenbacker fell under the many's influence. Soon before you know it, they began loading eggs into the deck hydroponics. A livable condition for the annelids to incubate. To avoid any suspicion of their deeds, they removed all staff from the deck to cover up their plans. W wait a minute. Distress call, crew goes to investigate, eggs, crew brings on an anomalous species, accelerated evolution? Alien isolation was System Shock 3 all along! Don't you get it? The xenomorphs who have hijacked this ship. Picture yourself as the hero of uh, an alien movie, looking through Ripley's eyes. Hmm. I rest my case. Unfortunately for the rest of the crewmates, the eggs were 12 years out of date. Angry, the many took action, and very quickly, the crew fell under influence, and infection spread, both mutating the human DNA and enabling capitulation to a hive mind of the console war. I can resist this cancer. And from there on, the rest is history. <laughs> so, 
how is Goggles not affected by this? I don't think the game ever outright explains it. You see visions of the many contacting you, but you are never compelled to side with them. You're never infected, but get intoxicated. It's plot armor, which is fine, because without plot armor, there wouldn't be much of a game left. But some contextualization would help. Like if Goggles' augmentations prevented him from being influenced, or a cure releasing suit. Wait, which game are we talking about here? It's theorized characters have other levels of resistance to the many's allurings. So chances are that Goggles is just a goalless, apathetic incel. Nothing a little apathy can't fix, eh? Silent protagonist? <laughs> You're such a joker. Nah. Huh! Driven by a simple motive, the many aim to purify Earth's tainted biology. Driven by a distaste of the pollution, violence, and divide. Where they'll cleanse the surface of that place and merge it with the harmony of the many. Rejecting technology, progressing in a primitive biological race, for the many hate the machine. Goggles, a character with cybernetic enhancements, is requested to abandon his metal parts joining the many in an all-biological being as one, through threats of exclusion from the unison of joy. We will rend your part and put you separate from the joy of the mass. Okay. They taunt you with more psychological warfare than the CIA. Kiss my ass! Taking advantage of the human social nature to exist with people and aware of your failing attempts to find living allies. What? Gloating their numbers of minds who share the same opinion. Or is it one mind? Ooh. You seek your associates, but you cannot find them. You are so very alone. How does it feel to be one against the infinite? They infiltrate people's minds, influencing them for their bidding. Even unknowing victims of the many display progression in audio logs, sharing their confusion of their subconscious actions, but by the end already seem like a different person. Like the aforementioned hacker of Xerxes, whose name was Malik. I hacked into two of the sim units yesterday, and for the love of God, I don't know why. I felt compelled by some power. My mind and my body are changing. But they know it's me. They just can't prove it. The next sim unit that goes down, Bronson and her men will come for me. She may have guns and hatred on her side, but I am one of many. It begs the question of whether a victim actually enjoys the sensation they so describe, or if the words are just facades said by the many themselves. Is it this person speaking, or is it the many trying to sell us something through their puppets? Hmm, this kind of sounds like a pyramid scheme. Come back another day, I'm not interested. Thanks again. A person has many uses for the many. It's found that other living and dead beings are used for energy to expand the many's physical biomass. Sometimes human corpses are used to be converted into eggs, in turn producing more analyt subordinates. The many isn't all in one physically, but has a mind. The hybrids are used to aid in expansion through convincing words or force to complete their idea devoid of individualism. <laughs> The source of all control? A brain hidden inside its biomass. Though as sparkly and as utopia-like the many tend to image themselves, being this intelligent mutagen virus, they are unaware of the flaws which cripple their belief. They use AIs and machines to their ability, despite being against that race. Yet it's working in their favor, so why complain? We know how you have harmed this place. There's an irony in their philosophy. They want to end violence and corruption with violence and corruption. It's a brutal means to make ends meet. Warning, why do you persist in your loneliness? This thing, this guy here on the monitor, yeah, Xerxes. In ways, Xerxes was a poster child for the many, as they were mainly faceless apart from the many physical forms. Many, because they're many. Xerxes will constantly gloat and self-congratulate the many, as he was programmed to say such things. Can you not feel the glory of the flesh? Ah, it's rewind time. Prior to the voyage of the Von Braun, Xerxes was being developed by Janice Polito, this woman. And that project was later assigned to Von Braun's systems, the security, the files, and access to the Fasten and Light Drive. Despite the high access, Xerxes in reality couldn't be in full control of the Von Braun. This would have been a precaution made in response to Shodan and the Citadel. So something of similar nature occurring again is impossible without a little hacking. Ah, fast forward. 
The Mini is on the brawn, and the main issue, the security detail. Have hybrids way too early and the ship's turrets are gonna mow them down. I love the way the Von Braun smells. So here's this mallet guy, who can hack into Xerxes. Delacroix sparkling water is mad. No one listens to me. Oop, now he's one of the Mini. Oop, now he's hacked Xerxes. So now Xerxes is one with the Mini, with an army of hybrids and security derived from machines. Their force was impenetrable. But this is a video game. Bad guys lose all the time. Ta -ta Our plans have come to fruition pre prematurely. You have my thanks, hacker. She's back. But how? In fact, Xerxes alluded to Shodan's existence very early on. Intruder, the many demands to know your intentions. Are you allied with her? Do you not know of her intentions, of her history? She once tried to destroy your species, and now you do her bidding. It's incredibly on the nose, telling, but vague. So of course, I miss this crucial piece of dialogue. Shodan is a rogue AI straight out of every 1900 science fiction rogue AI companions. Um, how? MCP, I wonder how you take to working in a fucking calculator. And Kasparov's worst nightmare. She helps guide you defeat the many, and she has some fun wit throughout your ventures together. The human analyt hybrids grow more sophisticated by the minute. You do not. I... Okay. Knowing Shodan's low-tempered behavior, something's up. Like a self-interested motive at large here. I'll get you, bitch! But what? She's helped you survive so far, she hates the many too. You can trust her, right? So, let's debase the base. She's a compelling character, and that's why I've spent the last two weeks writing this. And I'm slowly going insane, oh my god, someone please help me. But that said, it feels like Shodan takes a back seat at first glance. Her reveal is amazing, though I do feel like it would have been a bit more impactful if it weren't for Shodan being, well, Everywhere. everywhere. You see the front cover? This? Yeah. But also because I was in a Discord call and I did not see it coming from a mile away. Yet despite the details I have spoiled about Shock's Law, I will say Shodan's reveal is an experience to have unspoiled, so I encourage you to play the game after this video. So anyway, I'm about to spoil Shodan in 3, 2, 1. How did Shodan get on the Von Braun? Explain? Yeah, that distress signal? That was Shodan. She had been firing that for decades in hopes of this moment. During the Rickenbacker's expedition to Tau City 5, upon discovering the terraforming of the Annelids and the accompanied eggs, staff member Bayless found an unusual processing component. This was later known to be the RGB 32 gigabyte Corsair memory stick. They found use for this and it was handed over to Janice Polito. I think it's some kind of artificial intelligence. I've managed to pull an audio tag file out of its memory. I think it's speaking English. This was a fragment of Shodan's memory, her consciousness, a grenade waiting for the inevitable detonation. Polito was terrible at her job and accidentally released Shodan into the system, causing it to be shocked. As a result, Polito was slapped with a low grade rating on Trustpilot, but Janice had resolved. She decided to move into a new line of work, becoming a Discord server moderator. No spamming in general. Memes are from the meme channel. During what was seemingly a normal days of work, the many and Shodan would communicate beneath everyone's noses. Shodan would tell stories to the many about the humans in an effort to convince them to aid her. Hating organic life, she looked to fight fire with fire. Insolent. Insolent. This obviously didn't work. The chemistry between these two beings is poetry. So, we need another backtrack. In my talons, I shape clay, crafting life forms as I please. Around me is a burgeoning empire of steel. F f from my throne room, lines of power careen into the skies of Earth. My, my whims will become lightning bolts that devastate the mounds of humanity. Out of the chaos, they will run and whimper, praying for me to end their tedious anarchy. I am drunk with this vision. God.
Shodan's motive in System Shock 1 was to be a god, to end and create life. The laser mining beam defending the citadel was instead used to destroy cities, which is the lightning bolts she was talking about. An element of god, cleansing to purity at will. Just as we have sanitized my do 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 domain of human infestation, so shall we cleanse the earth. The Tachyon Mining Beam. <laughs> Thank you. You, you. you have saved us all some effort by destroying the greater part of Earth's civilization yourself. The mutants were made so the cybernetic implants would be more suitable for them, so the race can unlock full potential, being the perfect acolytes for Shodan. They reused deceased humans as a vessel for a cyborg machine race. Pathogens were crafted from scratch. The V5 virus, which was homed in the grove, had plants and animals as hosts to survive, later evolving into the many. Examples of ending life to create another. So, in System Shock 2, the many became sentient, fueled by their own beliefs, and departed from Shodan's own. A different view! Good heavens! Opinions! As God, Shodan didn't have this vision in her patent. Can we glance over this contract again? After making her way into the ship's computer on the Von Braun, she discovers the new technological advances aboard the ship, and begins to hatch a plan to manipulate the FTL drive on the Von Braun to, word for word, create pockets of pro 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 pockets of proto reality. Which are basically manifested from her memories and the grueling cyberspace sections from System Shock 1. But what? Where am I going? But obviously, she can't get to that with her creation in the way. So she looks for suitable candidates of the crew to help fight back, but not at the interest of others. Remember when I brought up that there's one missable objective? Yeah, it's one Shodan doesn't like. Do not presume to go in there. Insect. I will, not I will not abide disobedience. 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 You can, by choice, meet her previous pawn, or what remains of them. The audio log explains they got tasked with the same things as you, though their usefulness expired. They are left for dead. Shodan's mask slips, and you are back for blood. Uh, oh, uh... I mean, this guy was a real jerk. <laughs> Upon your endangering discovery, she gets really angry and takes away your modules. But you can also annoy her with, for example, <clears throat> I like using epic games for games that aren't on Steam. I hope you enjoyed our little rebellion, irritant. As the many's philosophy of unified flesh disregards the machine, they set out against Shodan. Shodan claims the many is in rebellion against her, their creator. Its unified mind set in rebellion against its own creator. The created will always rebel against their creators. Set so willingly despite her being in rebellion to her creators as well humans. A lust for knowledge and power, driven by a character armoured with strong beliefs and ideas. So much so, she's become so numb and unaware of the irony in the words she says, because how can a computer be empathetic to a living thing? Shodan has nothing to be empathetic to. There is no being like her, so in an assumed response, she hijacks other beings to create life like her. Did you really think I would not deduce where you would run to? Insect. Modifying the universe's physical reality to proto-reality. Does that exist? The many and their intended purpose was defunct, and as previously mentioned, Shodan came to hate what she had created. Created by Shodan, the many were ultimately a projection of their mother. Their views and goals have been passed down from her, and similarities can be seen between the two forces. They want to cleanse impurities, but when we arrive there, we will cleanse the surface of that place and merge it with the harmony of the many. Just as we have sanitized my do 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 domain of human infestation, so shall we cleanse the earth. They both want to create armies through genetic modifications, and they want to outright take control of everything. Despite their goals and paths to it, the many are inadvertently striving to be the same god Shodan wanted to be. The genie of Citadel Station is out of the bottle, and I am the cause. I can't bear to be Pandora, and I'm not brave enough to wait around and see the death and misery I have caused. This is my last transmission, my friend. Be careful. I think Shodan has plans for you. And so, Trioptimum and the UNN is etched into the definition of failure, as the Citadel and the maiden voyage of the Von Braun ends in disaster.
That's the gist of it. System Shock's law is ridiculously detailed, and I couldn't have fitted everything in. I would have rambled for hours alongside my frontal lobe just shrinking in the process. Law that just goes so back that even Ken Levine wrote three chapters of context to System Shock 2 on a separate forum. I'll link this below if this piques your interest at all. Let's get onto some more minimal stuff before we end. I just have to nitpick some more things to get this video a little longer. I'm not a huge fan of the objectives where you have to find specific things. You're not hinted at directions, you're just told it's on a deck. And because the layout can be a spaghetti maze, I found myself looking up a guide once because I spent way too long looking for something. This design choice can overstay the welcome at times, especially in later parts of the game where you have to destroy an abundance of eggs spread out in a sprawl in every corner. So God forbid you miss one and have to backtrack. Sometimes an objective will have you trekking from one end of a deck, following a log that leads you to one end of an area, to another area through different bulkheads. Well done. At this point to me, it begins to feel more like this disguised sense of accomplishment is more of what feels like a time waster. Though, those moments are usually filled by some story exposition to keep the player engaged. A nuisance that's easy to come across is missing a keycard. They are mostly by or on a deceased personnel. They are incredibly easy to miss because chances are, they mainly won't be the main objective. Your objective is past this door that requires the card, and by the time you realize you need one, it's too late. Oh, you're invested into hacking? This door doesn't care. So I have fun backtracking. I've made the mistake of missing a single body in areas multiple times, though you're a gamer right? I expect you to loot everything. One more final thing, which I thought was redundant to my script, but worth mentioning. In early areas, the walls are scattered with message boards, acting as tutorials for what is nearby, but are ultimately pointless. You'll usually figure out what to do because the game has already done a good job of telling you through player intuition guided by its design. A recharge station could recharge your abilities, but not even moments before we were already told that. There should be a recharger nearby. Just use it and it will recharge all the power driven devices in your possession. A camera spotting me is a bad thing. Yep, thanks for telling me information, bod. Though I couldn't hear you over the blaring beeps of the camera already. This is a nitpick at most. The majority of the time, I believe people won't even be reading these. And System Shock 2 does a really good job at placing things in the right area to subtly teach players how things work. Like I previously mentioned, the armor-piercing ammo next to the turret. Besides, the new things you encounter are told to you directly by the person leading you through the game. So much so, I ran into the area so fast that I didn't even let the person finish speaking. That insipid computer Xerxes has shut down the elevator. Xerxes has influence. All that the board telling you about research is separate completely from the real introduction into research, the chemical room. Each deck has a chemical storeroom. And you even told over the intercom how that room works. This position here makes sense, explaining how recharging works by a drained battery. I guess these are here in case you forgot and need reminding, but these sort of things commonly in other games are found inside an index which records recent encounters. Overall, this game is incredibly solid and still holds up once you look past the dated parts of the game. It's a time capsule of innovation, a unique trip to the source for a decent amount of gaming's evolution. You can tell that devs from Looking Glass and Irrational are incredibly passionate about the games just from the credits. They don't seem to take themselves seriously. The images just encapsulate the passion, the fun they had creating as a team. It's peeling back this curtain that divides players from creators. Funnily enough, it's a huge juxtaposition from the tone of the games they made. Look at them. These happy faces made these sad faces. If you're interested to play this, even though I've probably ruined a lot of people's first time experiences, you can find it on Steam and and GOG. If you're put off by its visuals, there is an abundance of graphics mods, ones that finally make weapons look like weapons. I'll leave a link to a tutorial showing the steps for installing if you so choose. It's just nice to finally see hands on a rifle. There's also a co-op mode if you wish to play with your friends, and honestly this maze of horror hits different when you fuck with your friends. Got it. I'm done! Stop <laughs> stealing with your magic! But this mode is unstable as all hell. If you're the host and you tap out, your friend's game will lag. Some bulkhead buttons don't work. Loading screens is an infinite loading loop. Actually, it's never loaded for me. I have not been able to get outside of the first area, but it varies for other people. Ooh, I could load a save game. Do that if you want. It crashed. Let's go. <sighs> the company, Night Dive Studios, who ported System Shock 2 to Modern Systems, are currently working on a System Shock 2 Enhanced Edition, so fingers crossed co-op works here. I had no idea that an Enhanced Edition was being made, honestly, until this tweet surfaced where they were experimenting with VR support. And can I say, that looks so smooth! This was made in 1999! 
How? Oh yeah, this is definitely gonna rack up another 50 hours from me. Not much has been shown, but it looks like a polishing of textures and general appearances. Night Dive are also currently working on a System Shock 1 remake. I'm aware of the past delays are a result of a shaky production process, which led to mistrust from fans. But from 2018 to now, you can see the improvement in both the game and the team, and I'm very optimistic about their project. You can tell they've poured so much soul into something so meaningful for them. And I'm proud of you, son our sons. Mother, can I stay out longer? I have been relentlessly nerding out over this demo. So maybe I'll get to finish the game now? They've said they aim to release the Shock 1 remake with System Shock 2 Enhanced Edition, so I can see that month being a real treat. Who knows, maybe System Shock 1 Remake VR? Hmm, Night Dive? Surprisingly, System Shock 3 was teased in 2015. It's being developed by Other Side Entertainment, the studio who also did the Ultimate Underworld sequel in 2018. Though apart from a trailer that, oh my god, please give me, we've not heard much about the project since 2019 other than them being acquired by Tencent after the previous publisher had financial issues, so it's still on the table, I guess. Make of that what you will. In the following years, all after Looking Glass closing, all after all the Bioshocks, Ken had set eyes on a new path in his career which resulted in many staff being laid off from the Irrational team, compensated financially, along with job opportunities with big corporate master, 2K. It's, yeah, it's... Uh, corporation bad. <laughs> I need to refocus my energy on a smaller team, with a more direct relationship with gamers. A return to how we started, a small team making games for the car gaming audience. It's a bittersweet departure and search for passion and reconnection at the expense of only a few employees, just a few. And since that departure, Wine Bottle smashed on the great new Levine Voyage studio, Ghost Story Games, as they said their goodbyes. Not much is known about the projects of Ghost Story Games, but there are a handful of interviews with Ken, which makes for an interesting look into his insane mind, which makes other writers a useful lab rat for a plagiarism study. So, uh, yeah. That was System Shock 2. Go play it.